Macbeth is Shakespeare's horror play about a couple and how their evil ambitions destroy them. Macbeth, yes. Bloody, bloody play, bloody play. Absolutely cursed. And I spend a couple of months making little cuts and hacks and trims here and there. Oh! In order to get it down to 48 minutes, specifically. Ah, excuse me, please. Oh, oh, my goodness. So, really, I just go through this script over and over again and make cuts and then go back and it's still too long, make more cuts until I get it down to sort of the more, most concise telling of the story. And knowing that we're making a Shakespeare play for mostly high schoolers in Idaho, that really excites me because it's, it's a rare experience. It's not like they're seeing Shakespeare all the time and oh, here comes another Shakespeare play. So it feels special to me in that we're delivering sort of a cool package to them that they don't get every day. They, they go to a lot of different schools. Sometimes they have three shows in a day. So the set and the costumes, everything has to be easily accessible. Um, and the actors in this particular show, they're, they're using five actors. So five actors have to be responsible for running sound and uh, put, breaking down the set and putting it up for every show. Yeah. It's all a matter of perspective. Once we hit the road, our performing becomes the smallest part what we do, it's the driving and the planning and the prepping and the making sure the weapons are good and doing repairs on the set. You know, it's like being an old Shakespearean touring troupe. Sleep no more. Sleep no more. Macbeth is one of Shakespeare's very few horror plays. And um, when Dracula and Frankenstein first came out, those films, people started calling putting things in the horror genre then. Mm -hmm. Macbeth was already doing that, you know, 400 years before the horror genre ever came up, so Shakespeare was really writing for the horror genre before it even existed with this play. Macbeth is actually also in and of itself a really interesting tragedy because out of all of them, it has this really super strong supernatural element to it, which influences a lot of, of how the show falls out. So. <laughs> The concept for this show came from having worked on the show many times before, and I was always interested in the witches in the play and how they function in the play and the sort of thin line between when someone is a witch and when someone's just a person in the world and the duality of people and people's ability to be good and bad. So I started with that general idea for this show. We created really an adaptation of Macbeth where Basically, everyone in the play functions as a witch, and then they'll sort of pop in and be other people, and then pop back and be a witch, and that line is very blurred between good and evil in the show. It's pretty much, in this production, it's the witches who pretty much run the show. I mean, they constantly morph into other characters that we play, and they do most of the scene changes and stuff. The witch costumes are relatively minimalistic. It's cowl and some sweet goggles. So, because anyone can easily just pop those on at any time, the witches can come out of nowhere. Yeah. And they can come on, pop on stage at any point in time, and I think that's terrifying. I like all of the, the stuff with the witches, and the fights are really fun. Um, but I think, I think the, the, the sound and the music element to this show really adds, I don't know, kind of a a def definitely an energy to it that I really love watching every time. Being a person who loves horror movies and mm -hmm. basically only ever wants to watch horror movies, one of the things I did was become aware of how those were constructed. And one of the things throughout horror movies is the sound of horror movies and the atmosphere of horror movies really, really, really helps to set the scene. So I wanted to have a composer to come in and design the show from beginning to end, moment by moment, to really create a score to go with this horror play that we were going to try to make. It's awesome. The sound designer, composer, um, the atmosphere manipulator, as he wants to be called now, he um, is also creating things on the spot and saying, oh, what if we have this sound here? And so it's all happening just totally in the moment in the room.
It's great. I mean, I think I think Sarah creates a really um, collaborative room. And sometimes we'll be playing around, and someone will do something really funny, and then lo and behold, uh, Sarah will be watching that and say, "Keep that. Put that in the show." And we'll be like, oh, "Okay, cool." She just lets you go, and she just takes your ideas. You can say your ideas, and she's not going to be like, "No, sh you know." Like she'll she'll be like, "Oh yeah, let's try that. Let's try it." So, you're going to have to be on the road together for how long? Ten weeks. Ten weeks. How's that going to be, spending that much time together? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Every hotel that we go to, Dakota and I are building bunk beds. Yeah. Part of what makes all of us going on tour really, really lucky is that we are all really close friends and we all get along really well and I think that's a key element of being able to tour together. The best advice I have ever gotten and I got it before my first tour, and it's been handed down from tour generation to tour generation. And it started with Danny Peterson, and he said, when someone wants a Twinkie, you pull over and you get them a Twinkie. Yeah, that's like the, that's like the one rule, is that you gotta get people their Twinkie, whatever their Twinkie is. So if, you know, someone wants some coffee. Coffee. Um, then you, you get them some coffee. It's not a big deal. Other people need food. Dakota's a food person. When I don't eat, I just turn into a creature. So, that I know. Um, <laughs> we're, we're very, we're, we're kind of rule junkies on certain things about how we operate as a tour group. Like, we always leave 15 minutes before the time that it says that we're supposed to leave. We do uh, the, the high school reports immediately following the shows. The, 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 the van usually leads and the Penske follows, and the Penske and the van are never allowed to leave each other's sight. There's this really cool part of our process where we don't have a fight choreographer who lives in the state, so we do FaceTime with him. Yeah, Skype? No, well, FaceTime. Because Skype wasn't working. I wanted to work with a choreographer who I knew really well, and he's actually um, someone who has acted in Shakespeareans before, so he knows the form well also. It's happening. Hey! Hey! How are you? Good, how are you? Michael lives in Pittsburgh where he's going to grad school and he wasn't available as much as you would normally need a fight choreographer to be available. So because I'm a graduate student I had to go back to class and so I was only available to be in the rehearsal hall for the first two days of uh, rehearsal. So uh, I was able to choreograph and work with the actors. So at the time when we would normally have the fight choreographer come in and brush up and make sure that we're being safe in the fights, which is always the ultimate concern, instead of having him in the room, what we would do is call him on an iPhone and use FaceTime and perform the fights for him, and then he would give notes to the actors as if he were sitting in the room. I think all of us who get to do it feel like it's one of the best jobs that we get to do every year. We are so grateful to be able <laughs> to do this. Yeah, and I think we just love it so much mm -hmm. that it's that it's worth taking care of because yeah. it is such a cool thing. Mm -hmm. Not too. I mean, there are mornings where we're up at four and we drive yeah. three hours and we perform at a school. And, I mean, sometimes those mornings are the best performances for whatever reason. When you have those shows, like it's 7.45 in the morning in Emmett. That's one that always stands out in my mind because it's one of the first of the year. It's cold and it's bright in the morning. Yeah. And 10 minutes into the show, you would have thought it was a Friday night and everyone had paid to be there. Because of the look on the, I mean, you can see the change, you can feel the change happen when you're just as surprised as they are surprised that they are enjoying Shakespeare and understanding it. I think the biggest difference between the big towns and the little towns is that the smaller ones, since theater doesn't, come through their area nearly as much, then they are much, much, much more appreciative and it's that much more magical to them. I have. I've been actually touring for 23 years. Um, my favorite part of the tour is Observing the reaction from our audience in this show, 
um, the elementary children. But it's so magical to them at this age. Something about when you're that young and you have these adults come in and pretend for about 50 minutes, it's a really a magical time. My favorite part is probably the idea of um, knowing that the show is going to be taken to, to the kids and how they're going to react. Um, and that I love because you're bringing literature alive for students for sometimes the very first time. Um, I actually was rereading a bunch of H.G. Wells stories, including War of the Worlds, which is one of my favorites, and um, The Time Machine. And I started thinking, why is this guy so amazing? And he wrote about airplanes before there were airplanes, he wrote about lasers before there were lasers, and submarines before there were submarines, and space travel before all that. And so I did a little bit of research about him, and I started thinking it would be a really great uh, idea to take these stories and put them on stage. Well, for one thing, Dwayne is brilliant. And um, he is such the, the embodiment of positive energy. And he's always looking to uh, improve, um, but also take your ideas into consideration as well. I decided that I really wanted to do this show after seeing a reading of it. Um, and I just loved the idea of H.G. Wells as a kid and where he might have gotten the idea for these stories. So it's called H.G. Wells' The Science of Fiction, and I play a young H.G. Wells, who is Herbert. Herbert, Herbert George Wells, and he hangs out with his best friend Philby, who Lina plays. Yeah, my character Philby is this like cockney apprentice lamplighter, and she's super plucky and um, just loves to act out H.G.'s stories, and so they get together at night, um, when this weird old man comes yeah. with his cart and sets up shop, and we're not really sure what he's up to. But... Who do you call an old man? I knew that I wanted to work with Lina and Ian and Rod. Rod, because of his history with ITY, he's been a part of ITY for such a long time, and the character is such such a charactery character, which sounds really smart, but. Um, I thought that Rod would be perfect for it, and Lina um, has this incredible ability to move from character to character pretty seamlessly, and, and looks like a little Julie Andrews, and so I'm a little bit in love with her. And I, so working with those two, and then with Ian as being this stoic H.G. Wells, it just felt, it was just such an easy pick. It was perfect. In a work of fiction, you know, like short fiction, or a, or working on a novel or something like that, you have a lot of control and the words are the words. And here there's a lot of input that can happen, you know, with the visual elements and the way that an actor decides to interpret those words. And um, so it's, it's scary to let something go and see how it uh, changes, but that's the reason I like it. super lucky because my hobby is my job. <laughs> yeah. So I have a I have a blast and I love painting and if I'm not painting at work, I'm painting at home. So this is I learned this from um, a painter. This is called this is an actual technique. It's called blocking, which doesn't have a nice title, but <laughs> um, and it basically just um, makes it so that it looks like it, something was once painted but that paint is chipping off. So, you just put your paint on your block, yeah. and then you rub it. You just pull it across. And, and not very hard, or hard? Uh, you can vary it. The harder you go, the bigger you'll get, like that. And you yeah. can go both ways. So you can just really make it look like there's just layers. Like this has been painted so many times. Wow. to have sort of a body already um, that had some weird things already attached. So we just went with that 
inside just use, these are just like serving trays, and we cut them, and then put them inside there to kind of do that. Mm. Um, I pretty much just went around the shop and found stuff that could be welded or attached somehow. So, And then the bike turns into a time machine eventually, and all of this stuff gets added on. Um, and the clock sits up there. I loved it. I was surprised at some of the things that they found funny and how involved they were. Like Lina was talking about um, the time when she's in character and she says, stand back, stand back, and the entire crowd actually started to scoot back. It just goes to show that the kids are 100% right there with the actors. There were a couple of kids in the front row who were just like following my every word and so I just always wanted to like be there for them and um, even the kids in the back who are a little older and seemed like they were a little bit of a harder sell. It was really fun to bring them in and they were laughing so it was great. <laughs> and I'm sorry to all the all the farmers who were planning on their kids taking over their farms and we perform and I remember we were at Ledor in Ledor, Idaho, a tiny little town, home of the Tigers. It was like four towns came together and there was a kid and you could just see, I mean, the whole entire family sitting there. And you can tell they're all related and the youngest. I mean, I, overalls, I mean, like almost stereotypical. And we were doing Midsummer Night's Dream there. And by the end of the show, the kids' eyes were shining lights. I'm not, I'm just like, you went, oh my gosh, this is why we're doing this. Bleep that out. <laughs> Keep dreaming. Keep hope alive. Don't give up. Also, did I say keep dreaming? We could probably edit that out. <laughs> um. Do I look bad? <laughs> and. Ready oh, she's ready. Okay, she's finally Action. ready. Here we go. <laughs> Do you need a moment? Do you have a pipe? <laughs> I think I need to get closer to you. Back Beth. Uh, Macbeth? Macbeth. <laughs> also, as you can see, Michael is so handsome that we like to just be able to stare, <laughs> stare at him on video. <laughs> Hi. All right, so tell me about the show. The show, uh, it went really well. They dug my death scene. There was cheers. They probably just hated me that much. <laughs> it, when the violence happens and when the heavy elements of the show are going, you can kind of gauge the kids, like, if they giggle at this part or... I'm not making any sense whatsoever. What did you ask me? <laughs> Try you. You're a real... You're a professional. We all got fired. Like, I grew up in a really small town where we, we didn't have things like this come through. And how much, you know, more hope I might have had as a young child <laughs> had I seen something like this. I did see the Harlem Globetrotters, though, and that was helpful. They were very entertaining. <laughs> Next year, Shakespeare's... <laughs> does, the Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> this interview's over. <laughs>